All right, well, let's get into our featured review. Todd just said it finished 12th at the box office this there week. There we go. It was really hard to find, which I think we'll... We, we may this is box this office boffo, though. Everyone wants to see it. I mean, this is, this, you know, bigger than any Ryan Gosling movie for sure. So we are talking about I Saw the TV Glow, which uh, I, I was I was uh, talking to my in-laws yesterday, and uh, and I told them I went to the movies, and they said, what'd you see? And I said, I saw the TV Glow. And they said, oh, the TV Glow. I've never heard of that one. Like, no, the movie's <laughs> called I Saw the TV Glow. It was pretty funny. <laughs> they thought you were <laughs> joking or something? No, they, they thought the I, I was saying I saw a movie called the TV Glow, but... Anyway, that would be an interesting was, title too. It would be. That would sounds be. like so, an Abbott and Costello act. <laughs> it <doesn't, laughs> it totally would have happened with the that group of people too. It to, yeah, it would have. It would have. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's see here. Todd, I think you're going to start on this one. Tell us about I saw the TV glow. Okay. Uh, this movie is directed by Jane Schoenbrunn, and I'm pretty sure this premiered at can, uh, Sundance this year. Uh, it stars. Uh, Justice Smith and the younger version being Ian Foreman, they play this guy named Owen. He's a socially awkward kid. And he meets this older girl, Maddie, who uh, goes to his school, played by Bridget Lundy Payne. And um, she lets him come over to his place one night to watch this TV show called The Pink Opaque. And uh, his his like conservative mother, played by Daniel Deadweiler, wouldn't let him would never let him watch it. So he, it's like this big secret thing. And they both are like fully immersed in this TV show and they begin to lose touch of reality when they kind of start to manifest themselves in the show or maybe the other way around. Um, the supporting cast like speaks to me. This is, it's got Fred Durst and Danny Tamborelli in this supporting cast. This is awesome. Um, anyway, um, the, the, I was not a fan of Showman's last movie, which was we, we're all going to the World's Fair. And this one is no different, like, although it's slightly for different reasons. Like this one has a bigger budget and stuff. This is like the type of really pretentious pseudo horror movie that I cannot stand. Like this thinks it's being Donnie Darko. And that's a movie that was overrated when it came out and it got worse and worse over time. And I think this is going to have a similar path to that. The, the main character is not interesting to watch and he's not a good actor. Like the, the younger version of him is actually more interesting than the 28 year old playing a high school freshman. That is uh, the Justice Smith. And um, and the themes of the movie are not as interesting as it thinks either. And every movie about high schoolers nowadays, it thinks it's 13 reasons why. Like there's scripting on the screen. Uh, everything the characters go through. Uh, Owen and Clay Jensen, they both even work at a movie theater. Like is it, this thinks it's being 13 reasons why. The music of the movie is funky, and that's is trying to establish some tone. But in every movie of this kind since like Drive, I guess has like there's like dozens of these movies that come out with like non mainstream music, and it thinks it, it's like being edgy by making this the backbone of the movie. But that alone doesn't make you unique. Like sure, the songs are cool, and I never heard them before. But you just blare them in the background of scenes, and like just be, like using this music and making shocking images doesn't make you David Lynch. Um, and, and I mean, it's, it's not that I don't like movies that push the envelope necessarily, but this one, it kind of fails. Like, I mean, it, it, it gets, it goes way too far out there and it's almost incomprehensible in, in the end. And, um, I don't know. I know some people like this movie. I, I was not one of those people. The best part of the movie, I think was the trailers, because this is a movie that a, a 24, it's like this weird movie that they just like pushed out there in like bizarro project is pushed out there to like wide, a wide release. And like, there were like six trailers I watched. That I was like, I've never even seen these movies before or in these trailers before. And it was really awesome because I usually get the same like few trailers every time I go to the movies. Pink opaque also would have been a better title for this movie along with just the TV glow. So I'm, I'm going to this two stars, I guess. I mean, it's more of like a one and a half star movie, but two stars, whatever. All right. Two stars from Todd. Uh, I think I'm going to go next on this one. I, I actually really like this. Um, I'm debating. I'm like between three and three and a half stars. I haven't quite decided yet. Um, it would be an easy three and a half star movie if the ending had landed a little better. But I think this movie is um, it, it has this hypnotic sense to it that just kind of draws you in. And uh, I, I think it all depends on if you're able to get on that wavelength and get into that vibe of what it's dealing and and just kind of draw you in so when it has those moments it it truly like 
rattles you. And that, that's that's what happened with me. I, I really in, I really enjoyed this. I thought Justice Smith was great. Um, I think, uh, oh, who's the, uh, um, Bridget uh, Lundy Payne is basically a young Anne Hathaway. Um, and She's uh, like the same age as Anne Hathaway. She's like 30 years she? old. Like, I mean, like, that's what I'm saying. These actors are playing like well, young yes. high school kids and they're like almost 30. Anyway, she looks like Anne Hathaway. I'll, I'll say that. You, Todd, you mentioned Danny Tamborelli, but what I had to do some research on this. So Danny Tamborelli plays neighbor two. Uh, Michael C. Number Morona one. plays neighbor one. They were uh, the adventures of Pete and Pete. Um, yes. So they're, they're they're playing the neighbors. So I like that call out. The pink opaque, it kind of felt like it was like if you had like a, a, a through storyline to Are You Afraid of the Dark? Like that's kind of the idea you get out of the pink opaque. Um, that, that at least that's what I. It also uh, looked like the original Power Rangers show a little bit without yeah. the Power Rangers. Right. Yeah. The the bad guys definitely. And Fred Durst I, without a backwards hat is really weird to see. <laughs> I didn't even realize it was him until the credits. Um, I did spot Daniel Deadweiler, which was, it was kind of sad to see that she's relegated to stuff like this after you know, giving such a great performance last year. A three and a half star movie. Two years ago. <laughs> Relegated to a three and a half star movie, apparently. No, but yeah, having a five minute bit part after, you know, yeah, true. rocking it a couple of years ago. Um, I think the a great job driving that minivan, you know, it's hard the work. way I wanted, the way I wanted this to go is I thought it would have been really cool if it had ended in a very grounded way. And, um, and almost had been like a, like a uh, like a teen coming of age version of a beautiful mind. Like if it had gone that direction, that would have been a really interesting take on it. So wait, wait he, he wins the Nobel Prize? No, no, no. Like the whole thing is just like like mental illness, and it's a take on that, and not like supernatural. I don't know. I thought I thought it could have gone there. It could have been the interesting. Prodigal roommate returns. That's what he says when she comes back to the football field. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I'm down for that interpretation. That's kind of amazing. I think it could have been. I think it could have got, done something there and just kind of flipped the whole movie on its head. Instead, it it ends with this. I don't. I don't love those those uh, those really wide open endings. And of, you, you didn't think this wasn't going. like Donnie Darko, Terry? Come on. I mean, like other honestly, shows, I don't remember enough about Donnie Darko. Give it two stars. None of us give it a thumbs up. Apparently, I had a half a star. All right, I'm leaning more. The the more I think about, it, the more I hate the ending. So I'm giving three stars. But the the whole thing leading up, I I really dug and was into. So I'm going three stars. Zach, I don't know what I'm saying anymore. Tell me what you think. I mean, gosh, this was hilarious to listen to. I, that was that was solid <laughs> entertainment from both of you. I, I would have had this totally flipped. I would have never guessed that Terry would have liked this movie. I was thinking during this movie, this is not a Terry movie. Uh, and I thought Todd might dig it, but I don't know about I mean, this is this is outside the realm of uh, his comfort zone. Um I got to say, uh, <laughs> and part of why it's entertaining to listen to is because I really agree with Todd. I think this movie is pretty bad. <laughs> um, it, you know, it's okay. The last few weeks, I think we've reviewed a lot of shitty movies, but this is a different kind of shitty movie. <laughs> I, I didn't realize there was such a diverse tapestry of shit out there, but this is really interesting shit. Um, you know, it's not like the fall guy, which is interminable and unfunny and over the top. And it's not like challengers that just confused me, I guess. And it's not like, uh, you know, the movie with the female bodybuilders. I, well, it was a, actually maybe a little bit more like that film. Yeah, a little bit. Um, but uh, gosh, I don't know. I mean, does this movie have a plot? I, 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 I couldn't understand. It was completely indecipherable to me. And, and you know, I think the, the Oppenheimer effect a little bit, every, Oppenheimer Everything Everywhere effect is that we like to be um, uh, tar blown away by movies and not understand them because somehow the filmmaker has the secret to them that we have to unlock, but we can't do it. I guess that's something today that critics value, but I don't know what 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 was the story in this movie. It was very confusing. I didn't understand at all the last, especially the last thirty minutes. Uh, uh, and you know, I like. I mean, surreal movies go back. You know, they go. They have a long tradition. You know, you got Jermaine Duloc in France, and Maya Darren, and Kenneth Anger, and Marlon Riggs, and that's you know, th there's a long tradition of that. 
they're not necessarily narrative films. So within the first 30 minutes, I was kind of like, okay, I can't, I can't um, acknowledge this movie as a narrative movie. It's a totally experimental movie because there's no structure to it. There's no characters. There's no real chronology. So I guess I, I sort of dig that in a way. I also got to say, I like the idea of someone being trapped by nostalgia. Uh, he, he has the line, uh, you know, I'm not into girls or boys. I'm into TV shows. I mean, I respect that. He probably <laughs> watches Pluto TV, which, which really is the perfect destination for the pink opaque. By the way, when I heard the show was called Pink Opaque, I could not get it out of my head that that is a great name for a strip club. And probably the strip club that Bruce McGill went to in Matchstick Men. I mean, it all comes full circle. I believe that was the uh, the Rhino Spearmint, something like that. But I like the Pink Opaque even better uh, as a name for, for, for a great strip club. I think club. that's where Natalie Portman works in Closer. That could be it, too. Absolutely. <laughs> so all the strippers have pink hair. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, yeah, so I, you know, we we did our deep dive of Kramer versus Kramer a couple weeks ago. I really like the scene in Kramer versus Kramer where Dustin Hoffman is applying for the job and the guy is brought in from the party and he says, "Okay, you got ten minutes." That's the way I feel about movies. Okay, you got ten minutes. Okay, you got ninety minutes. I I, I couldn't get I couldn't connect with this movie at all. I know it's supposed to be a trans allegory. Lots of allegories out there. You know, uh, Scotty Scheffler's life is an allegory. The San Diego Padres are an allegory. Um, you know, uh, I, everything is an allegory. Um, it's our, this episode is an allegory. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't see how these characters represent trans identity in any way. I, but I'm not trans. So, you know. I just, I, I like Lawrence anyways. I like Tangerine. I like a fantastic woman. I wrote down those three. I even like Titane better than this movie. And I think it was doing something kind of similar. Um, two reasons I, I will say I kind of liked it though. Number one, my wife hated it, which, which was really funny. I mean, that was like amusing to listen <laughs> to her rant about it. And then number two, um, I thought it would have made a fun, overrated film at the Pinos this year. Asteroid City from that episode, I, you know, it's a, that was a good choice. This would have been fun. Screw you, Terry. Um, this movie, I I guess two stars. I don't know. I'm like Todd. I don't know. Is it a movie? It was. If it's not, I would watch it over the Fall Guy. I will say that. <laughs> It was more fun than the Fall Guy, and I like the I like the Beautiful Mind uh, direction of it. That's uh, that's very interesting. Is Marcy play one of the cast members of the show? Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I I guess. I, I I think we I think that needs to get on the movie poster though. Expands the diverse tapestry of shit. Like that. <laughs> well, you, you you know you get <laughs> spoon fed this really stuff for it. three months until the good movies start coming out. And it all kind of blends in, but it's nice to have something that is a little bit different tasting shit every once in a while. So I will I will applaud the filmmaker for that. Everything's an allegory. Everything's an allegory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, John, I'm sticking John C. Three Riley's cars. career is an allegory. Todd's lighting, allegory. Oh, man. Yeah, I don't even know if I'm glad we saw this movie this week. I mean, all three movies that we were thinking about other than this all got I didn't want to see pretty this bad movie. reviews, too. So it's I don't know. Prequel. Okay, Todd, we, we have to talk about the adventure that we had to go on to see this movie. <laughs> because oh, yeah. I had to actually is... go to an AMC. I hadn't been to an AMC since I saw The Father in, like, February 2021. Is Nicole yeah, so... Sidman still introducing? Yeah, she, she had a, a little bit, like, right before the movie started. Yeah, that there's so it's not playing the closest regal to us it's playing at is in downtown Seattle, but it's playing at every AMC in existence. So um so yeah, Todd had to go to AMC and I shout out to to um Brian Kuiper, who I saw on Facebook and Twitter posts that uh he felt like he was cheating on his local regal with Nicole Kidman because <laughs> he went to go see I saw the TV glow at the AMC. Um that's fine. And, and I told Todd and he's a and, you, you said uh, you agreed. It, it felt like a dirty act. But, it was. Um, it was very dirty. Did you guys like the trailers on. though? Did you guys see like a, a really interesting group of trailers? I did not. They were all. It was all. It was the same. It was, it was like Maxine and um, something yeah, about serial killer. But that it, I was, had it was. It was the green band. Was it was. It them. wasn't the red band Maxine trailer, which was no. It was the red band Maxine. Oh, I didn't see I it saw... in AMC though. So there I were saw a couple okay. AMC theater or a couple a, or A twenty four movies, and th there were a couple that I hadn't even seen the preview of, but I knew the movie. I knew of the movie. I was like, oh, wow. I don't even remember what they were. I think one of them might have been. Uh, I don't know. It was something playing at Cannes. I I, don't, I can't remember what it was though. 
But I was, I was just like, I was like, wow, these, these trailers are really cool. Like, I hope the movie is this good. Yeah. Can I also just say that Kinds of Kindness trailer is fantastic. That should be, a, a, every trailer should aspire to that. 46 seconds of just pure genius. And that's it. Start the movie. I don't know. I saw that trailer again at the, my screen. So so I didn't see this in an AMC. I saw it in a Regal yeah. because uh, yesterday we were going down to Portland to visit uh, to visit the in-laws and go to a, a Broadway show down there. And it was playing at a bunch of Regals in the Portland area. So I was like, well, this is a way to get out of a couple hours with the in-laws. So um, I, I saw it in Vancouver on the way down to Portland. Um, I was dropped off and then I was picked back up. And, uh, <laughs> well, that's a long drive. How did you convince yeah. them to drop you off? From it, and you and they drove all the way to Gresham? <laughs> Well, it wasn't that. It was like a tw- it was like twenty minutes out of a twenty minute drive from the theater to. They the, must. The you must have really coast. told them that the TV Glow is an amazing movie. Well, I, I said I, I just said TV I needed to see it, and it was you it was did, it was there. There were a couple of places in the area I could have gone to. Unfortunately, it was not at the one that was five minutes from my in laws' house. It was uh, so I, I was gonna have to drive twenty minutes regardless, and that one was the one that was on the way. Lloyd Center was a little too a little too far out of the way, so. Anyways, I, I still saw it at a Regal, and I got to see an uh, experience a new theater, which is always fun too. 